So, hi guys. Um, the talk I'm going to give tonight is called uh, No Rest for the Wicked. But actually, it's just an introduction to GraphQL. <laughs> so, some introductions first. My name is Ju. I'm an engineer at Alpha Sites and we build ambitious apps in Ember. So, talk to me if you want to know more about that. Um, so, who knows what the GraphQL is or has heard about it? Half and half, say? Yeah. So, GraphQL. GraphQL stands for Graph Query Language. It was invented by Facebook in 2012, and now it was made open. And it powers most of the Facebook um, native apps. So, it's called GraphQL, which stands for Graph Query Language. But I think what they should have done is to add this. So it doesn't actually require a graph. It's called GraphQL, but you can, it's backend agnostic. So you can use everything in GraphQL. You can use your Postgres. You can use uh, actual like graph database. You can use, I don't know, FTP, I guess. You can use, if you really re like risk, you can use something like MongoDB. Was this yes? <laughs> okay, so I was thinking we can start with a very simple example on just like how GraphQL works. Um, so if we have a table like this, it's called users. It has ID, name, Twitter handle, age, and country, and it's a very simple table. Also, we know that Will is a vampire. <laughs> there is a very easy way to get all the users in this table, and this is. Uh, called a string, because it actually is a string. So usually, GraphQL has only one endpoint, and you send a payload to it. Is this normal? Well, it's very white background, so I'm just Oh, OK. Very yeah. white backgrounds freak it out a little bit. But don't worry. Oh. It'll look fine on the record. Well, I can change it if you want to. If you can change it in one click. In one click, yeah. Is, is it a challenge? Oh. Maybe three? Is it fine? Uh, let's try this. No. The white is going to be white. Too white? Oh my god. Maybe this is better? Well, well I think this is better. Okay. Yeah? That's good. good for most of them, so. Yeah, so I think it's fine. So, okay. So I'm trying to fetch the users, and of those users, I want the ID and the name. And this is the result. I have data, there's a users inside, and there's the fields I've asked to the GraphQL endpoint. So, which is a bit weird, is that we're sending um, a string here. And here we're getting a JSON response, which is OK. I mean, um, so let's try to do something else. We're passing some fields now to the GraphQL uh, endpoint. And we're asking only for the user which ID is one. And we still want the ID and the name. And the GraphQL uh, endpoint just returns like this to us. It's pretty simple. Obviously, we also want to create um, users. So, which is different in this example is that we start the query with this little keyword, which is mutation, which indicates that we actually want to make some changes in the database. So we say, okay, I'm going to use this um, um, thing which is called create user. I'm going to pass the name Tom, Twitter handle Tom Dale, country USA, and I want the ID and the name of this newly created record. And I want you to assign it to a field which is called user. And the GraphQL endpoint will return something like this. Um, obviously, there will be errors. And for example, let's say in our example, the name is required. And you forget to send it. And the API will return something like this. It will say, OK, you've tried to. Um, create a user, but you didn't pass anything for the argument of type name. So usually when you're defining the schema on your GraphQL endpoint, you define what is required, what should be passed, what cannot be passed, and usually the errors are really good, especially compared to a normal API where you have to do all the dirty work. So all this was really simple, but as always, relationships make everything more complicated. <coughs> Um, so if we have another table, which is com company, and their alpha size and Heroku, and here we add a company ID to each user, in this way we can send um, queries which are a bit more complicated. So for example, in this case, I'm still asking for the user which ID is one, 
but now I'm interested in his ID, in the name, and then on the name of his company. So in this way, basically, I'm telling the endpoint, I actually want all this information in the same payload. Ooh. And the endpoint will return something like this. So it just like does everything exactly as you would expect. Something a bit more fun is actually we can repeat this process. So for example, I can ask for this user with this ID, I can ask its ID, the name, the company, and for that company, I want the name. And for that company, I want all the names of the, his users. And I want the endpoint to assign it to the employees field. So the endpoint would return something like this. So data, user ID, name, company, alpha, says employees. And if you notice something, it's quite striking, the similarity of what I'm asking for and what I'm receiving. It's exactly the same thing. Um, so I think, I mean, well, I, sh I should stop like shocking you like this. Um, so why should I use it? Um, if you read through all the Facebook mm, articles, they will read, um, like use a lot of these um, buzzwords. Usually my actual response when I read any of the words in this page is something like this. <laughs> so. Yeah, so it was really, really hard for me even to read the articles because every three sentences they would use this really, really buzzwordy words, which I think are a bit, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, this is my <laughs> normal response. And then I can just can't take it anymore. You'll see like this dog, what it does when he can't take it anymore. Just like, guys, just, like, too much bad word. <laughs> I just go. <laughs> Um, so, uh, instead of using all the buzzwords, I thought, well, maybe I can just do, mm, just like explain why I think GraphQL is amazing. And I would just start from the title of the talk, which is No Rest for the Wicked. And I mean, who likes the good guy, right? So, let's say we have a REST request, get users1. So, what's going to be the response to this request? And the thing is, we don't know. We have no idea. We have literally no clue what the response is going to be like. Our only way to, to like understanding that is to load up a documentation, if there is one. If there isn't, you have to open up the source code, or you just try to call it, and then look at the payload in the Chrome inspector. Instead, if I see something like this, a GraphQL request, and I'm user of the ID of one, and return me the ID and the name. I can pretty much predict that this is going to be the response. So you can see like, there's like a striking similarity between the shape of the request and the shape of the response. They have the same shape. And, it's like, and, and so this is something I think we've always taken for granted that it's not possible. We don't care about that because, um, I mean, I'm t just talking for myself, but I've started programming as a Rails developer, so. I feel REST is like part of my blood in some sort. Um, so there's really like cool programming concept which is called what you see is what you get. And I think it's really, really nice when you're working with something because you have no surprises what you're going to get. And if we want to be a little more sophisticated about this is every time you're sending a GraphQL query, it's actually a contract between you the client and the backend. And what's more interesting about that, it's, it's not only a contract, but you decide a contract. So you, the front end developer, you're setting up a contract with the backend and you're driving the whole thing. So you can basically ask the backend to do a lot of things for you. You can ask him to alias fields. You can do a lot of things and the backend would probably just like do that. Um, there is this concept which is very well known, and I'm, I'm sure most of you know this, uh, which is called like solid. They're like mm, pro good, like object-oriented programming principles. And I'm sure that someone of you knows what the I stands for. Inversion of control. No. no. And that one. No. Come on, guys. Everyone would know at a Ruby meetup. Well, anyway, <laughs> it's called interface segregation principle. And when you're studying like uh, object-oriented patterns and you're programming in Ruby, you're like, yeah, I don't need this. This is mostly like meant for Java interfaces. Um, but what I want to do is uh, I'm just trying to 
um, read aloud some of the concepts of the interface segregation principle. And I want you to think about REST and GraphQL. So it says, clients should not be forced to depend on methods they, they do not use. Many client-specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. The dependency of one class to another should depend on the smallest possible interface. Make fine-grained interfaces that are client-specific. Okay? So, let's go back again to the example, right? I'm just using this totally um, random service where you can post repos to. And I'm sending this REST request to this endpoint. I'm creating a new repo. And this is the actual payload that I get back. You can't see it, right? Because there are so many fields, you can't really see anything of it. There's like a lot of URLs and a lot of information of the owner of the repo. <laughs> if we try to do, oh, uh, exactly. <laughs> so I like to give like a, a bit more character to REST and e ISP. Um, so instead, if you think about a GraphQL request, it's something like this. I'm creating a mutation. I'm creating a repo, name, description, homepage, private, has issues, has weak, has downloads. And I want you to return me the ID, the name, the clone URL, and the avatar of the owner. But assign it to a user, because I don't care. I just like, I want you to call it user for me. And the API endpoint will return something like this. Well, if everything goes successfully, that is. If it doesn't, it will tell you exactly what went wrong, what you missed, and what was required. All this, like, as soon as you define the schema. So you don't have to write your own code to handle all these errors, right? So the endpoint returns something like this. Um, so basically, GraphQL loves the ISP. And what is, like, it just mean, what does it mean is that Every time you're writing a um, GraphQL query, you're just like creating one very client specific, one interface which is very client specific, which is just for that page. And it basically means that every time you can write a different query, it will create another interface. And you can create an infinite number of them when, whenever you're creating a new um, query. But yeah, <laughs> and, I mean, it's just like, it, if you talk about principles, I think it's really, really easy to think, oh, it's a principle, so it must be true. And I guess a natural reaction is like, well, I don't care about the principles. I just want to build code. Who cares about ISP? I've never heard it before, right? Um, but I think that if you just like stop for one second and think about how you develop Ember applications, you realize, well, first of all, ISP has feelings too, so please don't be too mean. But let's say you have an articles endpoint, which returns some articles for newspaper. And in the front page, you want to display related articles for each article. So, well, it's easy, right? You add them to the payload. So every article will have some related articles or a list of IDs of related articles, and this will fetch other articles, right? Um, and now every time you <laughs> have to use in any way the articles endpoint, you have to pay the performance price of either serializing all these other objects or at least running some queries to fetch them from the database and just return the IDs. So there is no way you're not paying the performance price every time you're using that. <coughs> but what if you could do this? Um, you could just like ask for articles. You just say, okay, for these articles, I want the ID, the title excerpt, the preview image, I want the name of the author, and I want five related articles, and of them, I just want the title and the preview image. And this will only apply from the front page. So every other time you're using the articles, you're not paying the performance price. And there's no way that someone who just joined your company and uh, needs something from an API and adds something, slows down the rest of the whole app, because it just like, doesn't happen. This is another. So hopefully I got you a little bit interested in GraphQL, but as we all know, GraphQL has been made by the devil. So can we actually use it in Ember? Um, and the answer is yes. So we've written, we've wrote this 
adapter for Ember data. And it's called Ember GraphQL adapter. And it does some, like a couple of nice things. So for example, it automatically generates queries and mutations. It supports field and object um, aliasing. It supports async relationships. It fully supports belongs to relationships. And it sort of supports has many relationships. <laughs> we still haven't decided how to handle them properly. Um, so you basically import the adapter. So it's nothing fancy. And then you import the serializer as well. And then you have a model which is, has a name. You fetch all the companies from the store. The add-on will generate a query like this. We'll send this query to the GraphQL endpoint. The GraphQL endpoint will turn something like this. The serializer will convert this into um, JSON uh, API payload so that Ember data can just uh, munch it and it will work. Um, so the, cool, the really cool thing about the whole setup is, I think, just like everything I've said is possible just because of how Ember data is well built. So for example, right now we're using this in production, but we don't have the time to convert all these resources to GraphQL, but we have one resource which is using GraphQL, and it has relationships with other type of resources which are on JSON API, and some of other them are on REST and they still communicate between each other using async relationships. And you can, when you open the inspector, you can just see them like loading up from different endpoints. But in the app, it just like works automatically. You don't have to risk, like uh, you don't have to pay the cost for the whole trans transition. And so you can just replace one resource and you can try it out, see how, if you like it, see how it makes sense to you. And so I don't think anyone has like an actual excuse, oh, I have to port everything. No, you have, just have to try one single resource. And on the back end, uh, there's this like reference implementation made by Facebook, which is called GraphQL.js. What well, we're using on Ruby is this uh, gem, which is called GraphQL Ruby, which basically um, gives you the ability of exposing this GraphQL endpoint. You can specify the types. You can specify different types of queries, of mutations. You can provide callbacks. You can, you can basically do a lot of things which are written in the GraphQL specification. And also, I've just added a couple of references to, um, I, I think the first one is the best resource to actually learn GraphQL. Then there's the Facebook um, page about it. There's a Hacker News thread where one of the authors replies to every type of question. And these are some of the articles I've read which are really good. And these are three videos I've seen. Um, so maybe I was thinking, if I have time, um, I'll just show something really quick, which is this tool, which is called Graphical. And using this tool, you can play with uh, um, GraphQL. So it's completely client side. So you can do things like, um, for example, right now I can do this here. I want to show all the authors the name and the Twitter handle. And also uses introspection to see, to show you basically what are the possible types of things that you can do. So for example, in the, you, you see like usually in, in GraphQL it's really important to distinguish a query which is just read only and a mutation which is writing on a database. So for this block schema, there's posts. So you'll see, um, okay, this is the post. I can pass a category. category. I can ask for the latest post. So for example, I could do something like this. Um, latest post and I want the title of the latest post. New feature tracking error status with Kadira. Or I can do recent posts. Recent posts count five. Or recent post count three. Oh, whoa, 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 I refreshed. That was <laughs> okay, it still worked. Um, and also you can create mutations. So as I said before, you can do something like um, create, uh, no, I have to type mutation in front. And then create author, and then I can say, okay, I'm using this ID, which is Jew, and I want to pass a name, which is Jew as well. And of this object, I want back the ID, let's say. And if I run this, it will say, OK, create author. And you see, like this one, it just like returns author. But I could assign this to something else, right? So you could say, Ju is this create author. But if I rerun this again, it will say, 
actually you try to create this, but this doesn't, didn't work because this author already exists and will tell you. Um, or for example, if you try to do something like, um, hello, uh, maybe here, Jewel. It will like, oh, this is like a bit too big, but it will say like something like really explicit. So unknown argument, hello on field create author of type block mutations. You don't get this when you're using JSON API, I think. But, and it's just like, you, you can see like how much easier it is to track down all these like little small incompatibilities between, between the front end and the back end. And it's just like, um, I was never a fan of like type systems. <laughs> In this case, I think it makes perfectly sense because like, you spend like countless amount of times to try to coordinate the front end and the back end. And in this case, everything is handled for you. Like, is, like you, you see, like this one, the first thing is what I passed, which wasn't no, like wasn't like the backend couldn't recognize. And then it also told me, but you should have passed the name to me, and you didn't. And if you just like um, try in the sandbox, you can try out all these different types and mutations. You can just like get just like see how it feels like. And they and if you follow the course, which is uh, exactly on Learn GraphQL, it's really good and it goes through like all the possible uh, things that you could do with it, and it also like goes like more in detail in how it works, what was like the reasoning behind it. Um, so I think that's it. Good. You can find the slides here, and there's the adapter. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about the introspection? Mm -hmm. So can the client ask the, the service what, what methods are available? Things yeah, exactly. Sort of so basically you can, you can ask, um, there's a keyword which is called underscore underscore type, and then you can ask, um, I think it's, you can do it here, type. Uh, I, I don't know if you can do it there. But basically it's the same thing as you're seeing here on the right. So you can ask for, like for example, for a post, what is a post? And we'll return something like this. So, and it still respects the same GraphQL um, syntax. So you, so you can extract the fields. You can just like get only the names, or if you want to get like their dependencies, their arguments, you can just like fetch them in the same way as you fetch your normal data. But you can introspect all the types and see how like what they they do expose. Um, something I haven't said, which the Facebook guys are super proud of, is that. Uh, if you're using GraphQL, basically you don't, you will never have versioning anymore, because as soon as you introduce um, a field to your API, it will be there forever, if you want to. If you want to add a new field and you want to deprecate an old field, um, you can deprecate it, and this will keep the old field still working. But when you do introspection, you won't show it anymore, so it will only show the new field anymore. So if you think about if you, you have this central API and it powers hundreds of different applications, um, how many versions of, of the API can you have like in a year? 15, 20, 100, who knows? But instead if you use something like this, um, you still like, maintain retro compatibility and then as, at some point when you're sure that no one ever is using that field anymore, then you can remove it. But it's still, it's still completely transparent. And also the client can do already some of the work because if you want to rename some fields, you can still pass an alias and just change your query. And you, it, ju and it just like works. You don't have to coordinate anything. And, and it works like a very high granularity. So you don't have to switch completely an endpoint. You can just like change what has changed there if you just want to opt in the new field which is improved and has like some more capabilities. Um, but yeah, I was super impressed by this tool. Uh, just like to have see how it plays out and it's pretty fun. Yeah? What about integration with Ember Data? Ember Data is, is mapped to REST metaphor. Yeah. The, you, know, you always go and get all the fields or most mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah. Um, and it seems like some of the power of GraphQL is that you can make custom queries and for, what it, for exactly what this page requires rather mm -hmm. than what your generic store requires. And exactly. So aware of how to be viewed. Do you think that's a good mapping or do we need a, a new 
and the data is more aimed at the graph type back ends that could utilize some of that power mm. and efficiency? This is a really good question because exactly what we're doing right now in the add-on is just enumerating all the attributes, right? And then we create this payload, we just like send it. So it's a bit anti-idiomatic, uh, right? Because th they're all about just ask for what you need and we actually have all the fields in the Ember data model. Even there, I think it's, ju it's still better because we just send, like we just like ask for these fields. Well, right now we get all the fields anyway. But apart from that, I think what, what could be improved, what I'm planning to do is to add this support when you're setting an, a relationship between objects to be able to tell that I want this other object in a relationship and I only want these fields of this object. So it overrides basically all the attributes in the Ember data model by just like giving precedence to this list of fields you've just specified. And I think it's super useful because even if you're using async relationships in number data, it, you're still loading a lot of stuff you don't care about most of the times. And it, just, it feels weird. And over time, it's dangerous because people will, have, will need more from a certain endpoint. They will add those fields to that endpoint. You will have to pay the price even though you, you shouldn't pay the price because you're not using those fields. And especially, like right now, everybody's going towards microservices, right? So you're using the same API in 10 different apps. And 10 different apps have their sort of like own terminology. They have their own necessities of what actually to load. And you're always like fighting and making, like right now in my company, I have to play the role of the gatekeeper of that API because I don't want anyone to make it slower than it should be. But instead, if we had a GraphQL on that endpoint, I wouldn't, need to, I wouldn't need to do that because if you want to load more stuff and you want to make your app slower, yeah, it's okay. As long as the rest of the other like 10 applications don't get slower. So I, I think this like um, we've given for grant we've taken rest for granted for a long time, but the more you try to go over a service-oriented architecture, you feel this pain every day. And what they do with GraphQL, apart from all the syntax and nice things, they're just like inserting this layer in the middle. So for example, I've heard this talk by um, I think I've added a link here. Um, oh yes, it's here. I've uh, I've heard this uh, talk by this guy um, who worked in Rework uh, Financial Times website. And they, he said they had like 10 different APIs in the back end <coughs> and five front end apps. And this <laughs> each one of the front end apps was like sending a lot of requests to different services. And instead now they just send to this central GraphQL endpoint, which then loads stuff around. But it's a huge advantage and um, even though it was made by the devil, I think the devil has like a lot of <laughs> tools <laughs> at his disposal. <laughs> so, yeah. How well, this compares to Ember, J oh, sorry, JSON API. With mm -hmm. API, you can also white list what you want. Exactly, okay. exactly. But and, even, and you can even request JSON API to include nested relationship mm -hmm. with any arbitrary depth, like JSON API, just with different syntax, because yes. this has it's part of the URL instead of being part of the data set mm -hmm. with the request. My main problem with JSON API is that it could do all these things, but it doesn't. So for example, this includes and possible like fields you want to extract. They're part of the specification, but like I, I think like it's they're not really being pushed. You know, they're, they're, they're part of the spec because someone thought it was uh, interesting to have, but even if you see the syntax that you use in JSON API to do this, it's a huge string. So if you think about making something a bit more complex, it just becomes completely unreadable, right? There, like, I think that when you see something, it's just like under-engineered for this purpose. And instead, when you read a J, uh, GraphQL query, it's just like the right way, it has the right feel. And then you see the shape of the request, you see the shape of the response, it's exactly the same shape. If you see the JSON API request, it's still sort of, it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't feel right. But it is it's going to be parsed by a machine anyway. Well, it's going to be parsed by a machine, but you are not a machine, okay. right? But when, when you're, especially when you're working, when you're developing very often, yeah, you want to see how stuff is, like, what the thing is doing. You, uh, you still have no idea most of the times anyway about, like, what the computer is doing. 
but it's at least when you get a chance to see the thing and you compare there, it's like, mm, okay, this makes sense. And instead, what it feel like in, in JSON API is, is exactly, they're trying to make a protocol which is readable by machines, but I have to work with it, unfortunately. And just like, it doesn't feel right to me. But um, I don't know if it's like something personal, but there's a lot of people I've spoken with that feel like JSON API is too verbose. It feels like soap. Is that soap? Um, and, and, like, and something else, for example, which I think is really cool in GraphQL is like you have the capability, if you want to, to just write one giant GraphQL query, especially if you're developing a native application. And th that query just loads everything. You don't have to have links to go around, go back, and do all this sort of stuff. And that giant payload is actually going to be used just by that part of the app or by that specific app. It's not going to slow down anything, like anything of the other apps that you have. And I know it's a bit of a pity, especially in Ember, because like uh, all the adapters, for example, are JSON API compliant. But there's, since it was like written in such a good way, you can just use a serializer to port your own representation into the JSON API compliant representation, and you just take that JSON API as the Ember uh, specification. And I'm perfectly cool with that. But if I have to work with that on a daily basis and try to get the right gem on the back end to do JSON API in the right way and get it on the, on the payload, it's just like too much for me. And I couldn't do it. So. Yeah, I think I have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, by example, in, uh, in JSON API usually, when you request, let's say, uh, 50 articles, mm -hmm. and each article has an author, yeah. this author happens to, happens to be the author of many of these articles. Is this, do you have this information duplicated inside each article or you have this article, sorry, this author in the root level only once and it's referenced by ID or something? Uh, uh, you can specify them separately. So for example, uh, in all the examples I've said, there's only one GraphQL query, but actually you can specify multiple of them. And actually GraphQL will try to be smart and try to um, um, basically compress the data if you don't want him to compress the data, you can pass some aliases in order to tell him, okay, no, actually, I don't want you to compress the data. Just like give them back to me separately, one to one. A very valid concern is uh, since you're writing a query, right? You're basically writing SQL, and you're writing this SQL which is open to the world. So you could write a really, really long and complex query which crashes the database, like theoretically, right? So I think the Facebook guys, what they do to do that is um, they assign a cost to each query. And if they have this, uh, these, this query gets transform parsed and transformed into an AST, and they evaluate the cost of the query. And if it's too big, they just like, you don't do it. They just like uh, return something and say, the thing you ask is like too expensive, we can't do it. Or another idea was just like to do uh, a timeout. So if it takes more than five seconds, just abort. Or something else is just check like how many, because the, the, the main problem is just like the nesting, right? So you can just say, okay, if you're trying to do more than three nestings, just like give up because you won't be able to do that. I think something else which is a bit left uh, also a bit un, uh, open on the spec is how to handle like pagination, for example. And I'm sure that Facebook has their own internal implementation of pagination, but you know, like, most of the things you can just like do them yourself. You can just like pass some meta attributes. You, it's not like super complicated. I think it's much more important to have um, a good mental model for how you're working rather than like having all like all the small things. You, m most of the times you can work out the small things, but if you have a big problem on the mental model that you have of your backend, there's no tool which is going to fix that. And especially if you're working with a lot of other people. Yeah, you're out of luck. There's no way to fix that. Like, you, you have to fix the system. You, you can't fix like the little tools. Um, what about yeah. uh, caching? I mean, is, is it not an issue for something like this where the client's making the contract? Yeah, it's a, it's a problem because basically it means that you can't really cache because you only have one endpoint. Uh, about this, I think what the Facebook guys do is to store some, basically prepare some statements. You know, the good old trick of databases. You, you prepare some uh, GraphQL statements and you send IDs to them. And then the client just tells you, okay, run me the uh, statement with ID 227. And they have this service just like um, lists all the like available hot queries. 
Um, but yeah, like usually it's a bit of a problem because you can't cache this, like in the way you'd cache REST calls. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, and that's how what like Relay does. Like, if you take a look, if you um, take a look at, like how they um, they built Relay, it's super interesting to see the potential that they use, like to the full potential which you can use GraphQL to. So, for example, they have this really cool example where they um, show a list of elements and they just fetch a very small representation of each object, and then as soon as you go into the more detail. Um, it will run a query which just fetches the fields you haven't fetched yet. So it's really smart. And I know that for most people, you just say, well, but it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things because you're loading an image which is just five megabytes, right? But I think it just like, shows like, how much potential that type of approach can have. And you never be able to do that using REST. So it's not, I, I don't think it's the matter of like how many kilobytes you can save, but it's just like how much potential can you have with this sort of approach. And I think it's worth it. You said you had some issues with as many. What issues are you having? Well, it, it's this issue of like, in like super nesting. So if you have as many is then basically the, um, in the, you have like right now in our, uh, serializer where we transform the GraphQL payload into uh, Ember mm, like JSON API compliant payload you need to basically be able to distinguish like if there's duplicated data or if there's mm, like if there's like too many nestings and stuff like that so for right now we're like oh we're just gonna use async relationships so the, when you're using async relationships obviously you don't really care about the has many that much anymore and you, you don't specify all the fields. You, and also, like when you're using has many's which are async false, it means that you're asyncing this, and you should async the other one, then you should async the other one. It's just like, maybe we can solve our own issue, but we can't really, I mean, we still haven't figured out how to write um, a generalized solution to expose to the world in the add-on. So uh, that's like the main, but, but the thing is like, in the GraphQL like, mental model, you shouldn't do that anyway. Um, I mean, you, sh like, you shouldn't like try to be too inclusive and include everything. But right now, just like for the simplicity, <laughs> and like when I, when I released this Ember GraphQL adapter and I switched one of the resources that we have in production, I didn't have to change any line of client, of like application code. I just kept everything else the complete same and just switched the adapter and the serializer. If we want, but the, our plan for the future, obviously, is to exploit this more. So we have, want to have like more customized endpoints to have, like, to be able to really exploit this uh, GraphQL endpoint that we have. So in the future, we'll have to explore that a bit more. But right now, we're just like, um, I'm just gonna touch this, like, as, like just like this is this really surgical intervention to it and see how it goes. And it's been working quite well right now. Like I've like never seen like something going wrong there for now. Well, it's really small, but. Uh, Postgres. So actually, just like Ruby code, which fetched this from Postgres anyway. So the backend code is just exactly like a Ruby controller, but in a more structured way. Yeah. Okay, I think that's enough questions. Sorry. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah.